God is so, so good. And, um, you know, last week I, I began a series, or I let's call it a series, but just, just, a couple of, uh, just a couple of messages on keeping it simple. And, and um, I just had that on my heart was, was, was just because religion likes to complicate things and, 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 and really, you know, people avoid religion. I, I, I'm, I, it saddens me where, generally speaking, the body of Christ is right now. Because if I had to go to any typical person in the world and I asked them, what do you think a Christian stands for or believes? And if I asked you the question, what do you think if you asked any sort of random sinner that's out there um, that, that is not part of the body of Christ, that does not go to church, if you asked them, what do you think that the body of Christ is? What do, what, do you think that, what, do, what do you think that they are? Who do they think they are? My question to you is, do you think their first response would be, they hate gays, they hate people who have had abortions, or do you think they would say, oh, those are those people that just love everybody? It's a good question, isn't it? Because Jesus said, that's how the world will know that we are his disciples, by our love one for another. And I feel that the body of Christ has lost a bit of the plot eh, because we've started becoming judgmental and sort of finger and, and finger pointing and, and, and we start we, we all be being associated with religion and ritual and, and, and whether, you know, you see it in all the movies, you know, are you lighting candles? Are you following procedures? Are you following formulas? Are you, are you confessing your sins? Are you, and there's all these, these things that, that are, are imagery that I believe um, may, some of them may have some scriptural foundation, but there's a lot of them that's not even scriptural foundation. And if you hang out at Lake Haven Church for any length of time, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we hope to walk in the truth of what God has for us. Um, but, you know, we have, to, we, have to be, we, we have to really have an experience with this love of God that we always talk about in such a practical way that it literally overflows. Like Jesus said it would in John 7, he says, you know, from your heart, from your belly will flow rivers of living water. And I love that. Jesus, Jesus said that, that, you know, that, that when people saw him, you know, they associated Jesus with hanging out. The religious people associated Jesus. He says, you hang out with gluttons and drunkards. That's what the religious people thought of Jesus. That was his first thought. Oh, you, you're the guy that hangs out with gluttons and drunkards. Well... I know it's getting real quiet here, sorry. <laughs> but, but, but Jesus was, was so full of acceptance and love. And, and, and listen, you know, I'm not going to make that, that's not my message today, but, but we have to, we have to re-look at, at what, we, what we absorb and what we receive and how we live our lives before men. Because they said that we shall, we, you know, um, in, in I think it's Matthew 5, 16, um, it says that we should so shine our light before men that people will glor see our good deeds and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. We are called to shine light. That doesn't mean Bible bash. That means to love people. That, and, and listen, listen you, you can love a sinner even while they're sinning. You were once one. You do realize that, right? You were once a dirty, rotten, scoundrel sinner too. And it says, while, John, Romans 5, 8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ loved us. Yes. Though they are, listen, sinners have no capacity to do right. Why do we expect them to behave right? They have no capacity to. They are unregenerate spirits. They are dead. They are blind. Why do we think that we should fight with sinners and expect them to act righteously? They are incapable of righteous action because they are dead. If you want, a, if you want to see change in this country, we are going to have to give them the gospel. According to Romans 10. We're going to have to teach, give them the gospel so that they experience Jesus in and through your life. Yes. 
Not my life. Well, yes, my life too. But if you think that, you know what, you know, the, the pastor can, no, you, you are salt and light. You are the ones whose deeds they've got to see and glorify the Father in heaven. You. And if that's not a reaction in you, if you, are, if you're, if you feel like we're, we're these, this, this, this church that's got to tell everybody what they're doing wrong, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus, the woman caught in the act of adultery, right? When she was, that, when she was brought down, you know, they were wanting her to stone her. They thought they really po- painted Jesus into a corner. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna stone this day because she's done wrong. She was caught in the very, very act of adultery, right? Jesus had an incredibly wise response because he was listening to the Holy Spirit. He was tuned in. It took a moment. But he was tuned in. He says, well, why don't, why don't you guys who have never done this, this sin of the same kind, that's what he actually said, like sin, let you who have never done that kind of sin before, why don't you throw the first stone? And then he said, woman, where are your accusers? They're not here, they've gone. Well, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. You see, grace always comes before the go and sin no more. Grace and mercy, and, and, I, and, I, and I belabored that point last week, grace is not mercy. Mercy is not grace. Mercy is God's willingness and desire to treat us better than I reserve, uh, that, we, that we, you and I deserve, and it's always there. It's always available. We can always rush to the throne of mercy. His mercies are new every morning and great is his faithfulness and just studying the mercy of God we could we could spend weeks just pulling out scriptures and it's exciting to know that God is incredibly merciful and how he is and he's had the mercy that he has on us gives us this willingness to jump into into God's arms and that's what our message should be for sinners God is merciful now that's not the same as saying listen you guys can go ahead and sin but you see, that's what we're terrified about. I wonder what we would have done with that woman caught in the act of adultery. Because, of course, Jesus is the exact representation of the Father, right? He only does and says what his Father does and said. So how Jesus reacted and acted with the woman, and a couple of times there were prostitutes involved. There were a couple of times that there were people that committed adultery. What were the woman with the well in Samaria? How many times? Had she committed adultery? But Jesus had a word in season. He had a word of mercy because he knows that receiving mercy and love is the only way that we can, we can touch a regenerate heart, an unregenerate heart, with the love of God, that they can tell me that this is, it is, of course, like I said last week, too, Romans 2, 4 says that it's the goodness and kindness of God that causes people to change their minds. It causes them to metanoia, to repent. They change their mind. It's the goodness and kindness of God. That's we have to introduce people in our life, in and through our lifestyle, to the goodness and kindness of God. And that's got to be a natural outflow. That's got to become part of you. You can't, it can't, it, it's got to be so part of who you are. It's part of your DNA that it comes out without you even thinking it. It's not because you're going to turn to the scripture while you're standing at the gas station. You know what I mean? Let me get my preacher to look on. Let me tell you, Let me, just hold on, I'm about to read this powerful scripture. That, that's not what it's talking about. It's not about preaching to somebody from the Bible. It's about living, living that life where people are saying, what's up with you? What, what, you, you, you you're different. But is the world experiencing different through us? That's a challenging question, I know. Because I don't feel very different when I get my toes stood on. And I also know that there's evil in the world. I understand that there is evil. There's actions that they are doing, some of them that are downright evil. But does that change the way they can get born? No, we've got to love them irrespective and separate from their sin. That's a big deal. You and I have to love people apart from their sin. Then we are like our Father in heaven because He loves the evil and the unthankful. He loves His enemies. He does good to them. 
that despitefully use him. So, you know, in this, in this religious world that we're in, as I said, we've got, you know, the, the uh, I, I used this little illustration last week. I'm not going to go through the whole thing again, but I'm sure many of you grew up with one of these. And, 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 and I, I said this, you know, in, 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 if you think that the world is complex or, or religion is complex or the Bible is complex, um, another thing I didn't say last week, but I had meant to say that if, if you feel, if you find that the Bible confuses you, then you've got a hard heart. I'm going to let that drop and sink in a little bit. Let me explain. When your heart is malleable, you know the word malleable? When your heart is changeable, when you're willing to believe it God's way, things start falling into place. Your heart, when you receive it, it's when you are determined you are going to hold on to the way you believe. I know what I've been told. I know what I've been taught. And I'm not letting this go for anything. Then, when you, that's the attitude of some part of your heart, and truth comes to you, it offends you, because it's like, uh, that doesn't... I'm confused. Why is it so confusing? Mm, it's really not confusing. I tell you what, it's not confusing. When, if you go to people that get born again and you just give them, most of those people that have never known religion, that haven't had a whole bunch of tradition, that's good, and they come and get saved, hey, this is all cool. Wow. It all fits. It all works. It all is that. Why? Because they're just accepting it for what it is. We've got these things that we are trying, we will not budge. And we say, it's got to fit. I want this and I want this. I want to see it the way I've always seen it. And it's got to fit. And I've got to make this fit because that's my pet peeve. That's my pet doctrine. Does that make sense? So when you have confusion, when you, when you feel that when, there, there's this, when it comes to receiving the word of God, it's like you, you should... Again, like I, I challenged you last week, just go to the Holy Spirit. Go to the Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. He designed, Jesus left us the teacher for a reason, to help us. You don't have to listen to me. You go and check it out with Jesus. I, I'm, safe, I'm, I'm safe for that way, and I prefer it that way. You go and check it out with Jesus and say, okay, Holy Spirit, you show me what this is. You, you, you show me. Listen, there is a lot of stuff out there that I read in Christian magazines and that... That is so far from the heart of God, I'm sorry to say, that if you just accept everything because somebody is saying it, you're in dangerous ground. You have to be willing to use your Bible. I know that's a foreign word to many Christians today. It's, it's, it used to be mostly black, you know, it's a book about this thing, but but if you don't read your Bible, if you don't, have, if you don't develop a passion for God's Word and, you get, and you're willing to, to read it and to absorb it and to have a heart that's malleable and changeable, then, then, then we're in trouble as a church. Not, not Lake Haven. Nobody here, I'm sure. You know, no, those are for, you know, but, but we, we have to be willing just to let our hearts be changed. And, and you know, the parable of the sower um, is all about that because... I, and I, I love the way the Amplified version says it later on, but, but I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm just touching on what I said last week. But, but this, the soil, the condition of the soil, that, which is our heart, Jesus said, that is up to us, remember? It's the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. It's us. It's only up to us. It's our heart that determines whether the seed will even get into the soil. It's our heart. It's us that determine our will, my choice. Not God's will. You can, you can sit here for the rest of your life. You can come to Lake Haven Church. It doesn't matter who you want to go to. You can sit there the whole of your life and never change. Because if you don't choose to have soil that will receive the word of God and will allow it to germinate and you will water it and you will weed it, you will make sure that the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, desire for other things, don't come in and choke the word. Otherwise, the word of God will have no effect. In your life. You've heard me teach that before. But, but in Mark 4, 24, he said this, and I like it in the Amplified Version. He says this, and he said this to them, be careful what you are hearing. 
Be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you and more besides will be given to you who hear. It's powerful, right? The measure of thought. That's not just reading your Bible. That is about actually saying, okay, here I've heard the word. That's, I'm going to go and unpack that. I've got to assimilate that. I've got, and that's why we have A groups. I've said this before, you will get confused if you just keep packing in a whole bunch of varying information from 150 different people and you try and squish it in and you think that's going to build faith. No, it won't. No, it won't. It will not build faith. It's just information. Faith comes in a very spirit, and I'm not going to teach about faith right now, and, I'm, and I do believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, but it has to get into our hearts, and, and, and I've said this last time. So I, I, it's, it's important for us to understand that transformation in our life, that we are called to be conformed into the image of, this, of Jesus. We have predestined, we who have chosen, God foreknew, it says, and those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into his image. We are to become just like Jesus. And transformation, and I did a series on this last year, transformation is very different from changing stuff. Transformation happens from the inside out. Transformation happens when we allow the Word of God into our hearts, when we are malleable so that when it comes in, we we can easily receive that seed of the Word of God that that, 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 that works in our hearts. And as as that seed comes into our lives and, it, and, and, it, and we, we receive, it, it grows, it changes our belief system. I, I made this statement occasionally, but it's so powerful. Listen, if you do not change or do not allow the beliefs of your heart to change, your every decision from the, every future decision is already made. You know, you know, people will say this often. They will say, well, just follow your heart, brother. You heard that before? Well, just go ahead and follow your heart. Well, what happens if your heart is crooked? You, your heart will lead you in the wrong place. Oh, Shannon, no, no, no. Listen, your heart and your spirit are not the same thing. I've taught this many times. Your spirit, that's where God resides. You are got a, a regenerate spirit. Your spirit is untouchable. I'm not talking about your spirit. I'm talking about your heart. The one that God says we're supposed to guard above all things. Jesus said that we, if we can doubt in our hearts. Yeah, that's where you believe. It's, Romans 10 says it's in our hearts that we can believe. So it's not just following your heart. It's about, it's like if you, if you're, the decisions you've made that have got you here are they going to be the same decisions. If you've made bad decisions, you can change the, the, change the circumstances a little bit and exactly the same thing you will choose again if you don't allow God's seed and his grace into your heart to change your heart. Remember, that's, what, that's where we, we started talking about grace, and we did it um, in Victorious Living and, and last week a little bit. Remember, God's grace is His willingness, desire, and ability, to, and ability working inside of our hearts that enable us to do what we cannot do in our own strength and ability. And I've read this scripture, Romans 5 verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more those who receive the abundance of grace, and of course grace, as you know, is free, but it's not all it is, it's just, that's just whether it's, it's, it's just free, receive the abundance of grace, not just enough grace, there's more than enough grace, and the free gift of righteousness reign in life. You and I get to reign in life if we do it God's way. But grace is the key, as I've said. Grace is that key that if you don't understand how grace operates, you will not reign in life. Listen to verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, grace may reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace reigns through righteousness. And and I know know the word righteousness. As soon as if you've had a religious upbringing, some people see the word righteousness and they think, oh, right living. Grace reigns through right living. If you just live right, then 
No, it's never been about living right. That is dead works. You can't, you can't change yourself from the outside in. Jesus said, inside of the cup, out of the heart come the stuff that make you clean or unclean. Clean the inside and the outside is clean automatically. All we have to do is understand this is the, where the focus is. The focus has to be the heart. The focus is how we've got to get the seed of God's word, how we've got to receive it into our heart. That is cleaning the inside of our hearts and lining our hearts up. And then the outside will automatically come together. That's where transformation comes. That's where transformation flows. That's where the power of God, the dunamis of God flows from our hearts. That's where he resides. So it's in our heart. Remember, the, if we do not allow our hearts to be changed and to transform by the word of God, the way that we see things, do you realize that the way you even see God and I see God right now, we don't see him as he is. We see him in light of our belief system. You think, oh, well, I know what God is like because no, we, we don't. We see but through a glass darkly. Because of our filters that we have. And that's why we are conformed. That's why we can see more and more of him if we on this journey, this lifelong journey of discipleship. This journey of saying, okay, Lord, I yield. Yes, I yield. And constantly have humility and teachable, you know, te it's so beautiful when you find a teachable person. You teachable people out there, and there's many of you, I just, it's such a pleasure to work with a teachable person because a teachable person you can do anything with. They, can, they are salt and light. They flow. And I'm not talking about being a pushover. I'm not talking that you can sell them, you know, what do they say, uh, like uh, a bridge in Arizona. What is it, a seashore? In, you know, I can't remember what the saying is. But it's not saying that you're that gullible that you're just going to believe anything. No, 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 no. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You've been given the Holy Spirit for a very specific reason and for many reasons. And he is a very active part. That's why we're doing this, this overflow conference. And the overflow conference, by the way, is coming up in April. But understanding the person and work of the Holy Spirit and the benefits of the Holy Spirit in our lives are critical. You know, you know, you know I, I heard this song and, um, today and there was that phrase that, you know, that, that he, makes, he makes all things work together for good. Right? No, he doesn't. A little bit of a shock statement, just so that I can, so you guys ready to walk out yet? Anybody? Lock the doors? No, no. No, that's not what that scripture says. Do you want, do you want to go there? Let's, do you want to just go and read the whole scripture there? Let, let's, go and, let's go and look at that whole scripture. Let's pull it out in context because that's not, exa that's not what he says. Romans 8 and... Um, let me just pull it up in my, because I did not have that in my notes ready for you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to precede this because it's going to, but I'm going to say, and we know in verse 28 of Romans 8, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good and for those who are called according to his purpose. And then at, before that, it talks about praying in the spirit. There is conditions for God working things to for your good. There is conditions because God, when you pray in the Spirit, and let's look at verse 26 and verse 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness or our infirmities. We do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Verse 27, and he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And then it says, and we know for all things, that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. There is, a, there is at least three conditions I can see there. And maybe four. It's not just, you see, there's this idea, and I'm, and I'm not going to go there, help me Jesus. But God... <laughs> You know, you know where I'm going. God in control, that, that you think there's that religious idea that I believe is a doctrine from the pit of hell. I, I don't know how, if I can say it any stronger than that. Honestly, I mean, the Bible talks about doctrines of devils. I'm sure that God is in control is one of those doctrines of, of, of devils. 
If you think that everything works out just because God is in control, everything works out just because that, that's not, that's not, now God is sovereign. God has God. He is the almighty. He is the preeminent one. That's not what I'm saying. But if you think everything always works out, then you, you, you have been sold a bill of goods that is very, very, very dangerous because you think automatically things are just going to work out. No, they will not. You have to participate with God. You have to receive the Holy Spirit. You have to actually follow His advice. You have to be the one to walk in His ways. You have to be the one to desire to walk in His ways. It says in Psalm 103 that God showed His ways to Moses. And even in Exodus 33, when Moses cries out to God and he says, Show me your ways. Moses wanted to know the ways of God. But it's his deeds that Israel saw. They only saw God from the external. They went to all the meetings to watch the miracles happen. Moses wanted to know him. And, 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 and you, when you desire, all of those things that, that we have to desire to embrace God with. And here, I, I love this because the Holy Spirit in verse 26 says this. It's, this is one of the greatest benefits of praying in the Spirit. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray, to pray as we ought. So there is a way that we ought to pray, but we don't know what it is. You get that? But the Spirit himself intercedes with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches the heart knows what the mind, the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for saints according to the will of God. He is the he is the helper that helps us pray. Learning to pray in the Spirit, and let me pray, not just learning, but practicing praying in the Spirit is just one of the many phenomenal benefits. And over here, I want you to see that if you just, you know, well, what do you mean? The Holy Spirit just, you know, just I'm just going to be praying. When you study how and what praying in the Spirit is all about, and you see, you see that it says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, that when you pray in a tongue, you do not speak, you don't speak to the mind. You speak directly to God. In verse 4, it, it says that. He who prays in the Spirit is, or prays in tongues, he is edifying himself. It's, then it says it doesn't make sense in verse 14. It tells you, so there's all these things that I, I wasn't going to just teach on, on the, the benefits of praying in the Spirit. But, but here, this one over here is so powerful because he says the Spirit helps us. That word helps is a powerful word powerful word that's not just a simple like oh he's gonna you know just gonna give you a hand no it's a, it's a three-part greek word soon anti lambano you've heard about lambano i've taught about lambano a number of times to lambano something is to actively receive it to take it unto yourself that's what the word lambano means it's not to, there's other kinds of reception and in, in the greek language but lambano is to actively go and receive it but this word helps is actually soon anti lambano it's anti means against and soon means together with. So it's like the Holy Spirit comes together when you're praying with you to help you receive something. He comes alongside you to help you to lay hold of something. There's a problem over here. Listen, that doesn't say that when you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's just going to go and do something. He doesn't, he's not your, you don't dispatch him to do stuff. We think that we can dispatch and we just stay here and God's going to, we can send him. No, he's going to help you. What happens when you're praying and then you get a, you, the, the, the Spirit of God says, okay, Shannon, this is what I want you to do. You've asked for prayer, so now I want you to go and take your bank account, drain half of it, and give it to this missionary. Do you think you're going to like, oh, hold on, what, whatever he says. He is going to help you to get where you need to be. Uh, and I know I went straight for the juggler with money because money is like, whoa, you brought up the money word right away. It's like, no, you know, it's like, no, uh, listen, listen, Jesus said where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we start talking about money, sorry, we'll, we'll do that another time. But, but I, t I tell you what, let, know this. When you know that the character of God is faithful and he's unchanging and he's forever going to be there for you, I'm telling you, he is going to, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Because if you don't do it, then he is not the helper. Do you understand that we are co-workers with him? We are, quote unquote, his ambassadors. We are, quote unquote, the hands and feet of Jesus. 
If I think, oh, well, let me just go and pray, and then we go and go to church here on Sunday. No. He's going to tell you to do something, act somewhere. He's going to give you wisdom in the situation. And that wisdom may be different every time about this very similar situations. There may be a mountain between here and there, and you faced a similar situation in 1936, and then now you've got this other mount, and you say, oh, well, this is how I did it before. No, he will give you fresh wisdom for that situation, for you, for all the factors, and he will like, that's how he, he will tell you, the mountain won't be a problem, just do it my way. We're going to blow up this mountain. We're going, you're going to, I'm going to give you wisdom to walk over this mountain. I'm going to help you to go under the mountain. I'm going to help you tunnel through the mountain. Whatever it is, he's going to give you wisdom, and the mountain basically will not be a problem between you and your promise. But as long as we have a ritual, and we're like, well, this is the way I've done it, and you're not listening, and you're not going to help. You know what I mean? So the Holy Spirit helps us. He helps us, but he's going to show us what to do and how to get us through. Amen. <laughs> I sound mad. Am I sounding mad? Okay. I, I feel, okay. Okay, good. Because I'm not mad. I just, you know, I mentioned this last week when I, when I was wrapping up. I said Acts 20, verse 26. Uh, Acts 20, yeah, Acts 20, verse 26. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. For I did not shrink declaring to you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. I like that. And then, and then in the Amplified, it says the whole purpose and plan and counsel of God. The, 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 word, for, um, it, the word for counsel is bule. It's like his will, his purposes. And, and Paul says, listen, I am innocent. In other words, he, he felt, he says, listen, I told you everything that I, I, you needed to know. And, and when, I, I like that because, you know, the longer you walk with God and, you know, you get pet, you get pet messages like, oh, we're a grace church. We're only going to teach about grace. Oh, we're, we're only going to teach about the love of God. No, God is true, and we've got to understand that His love is never ending, and His love is never changing, and His said is amazing, and, and mercy, and all of those things are true. But that is not the whole counsel of God. And then somebody else will say, oh, well, you've got to balance the love of God with a little bit of fear and judgment. No, 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 no. That's not right either. We don't balance grace with legalism. They're incompatible. But there is a whole counsel of God. Understanding God, there is God, that God is immutable and, and things that you, when you get to know him, that he is unchanging. He has never changed. He is the same God from yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed. There is no shadow of turning with him. There is no difference. The only things that have changed is certain covenants and, and, and things like that, that that have operated differently. But we're living in a new covenant right now that we get to celebrate often. And we do it on Wednesday nights with the bread and our grape juice or wine or whatever. And, and you get to celebrate the new covenant, this eternal covenant, this one that's been planned for all along. But, but understanding covenants of past help you understand, oh, that's why God had to work that way because it was a different covenant and this thing. But God hasn't changed. He's never changed. He is absolutely, and you've heard me say this so many times, he has revealed himself. He desires to reveal himself. He is consistent. His names are the same. Jehovah Rophe, Jehovah Shalom, all those covenant names. He is your shepherd. He is your banner. He's your victory. He will provide. He, he doesn't, he's Rophe. He is doctor. I mean, when I was in Israel, he is literally doctor God. Jehovah, your doctor. They call him the Rophe on the kibbutz I lived on for three months when I was studying Hebrew there. They said, I was, they, were, they had a doctor there, and I saw Rophe. And I was like, hey, I know that word. You know, he is, he is your doctor. Do you think doctors go out handing sickness? No. But, but there's literally churches that teach that. That God is going to do something bad to you. It's like, what? How can, how can these things that they call churches teach something that is absolutely contrary to the names and his character revealed? Because they don't understand. They, they're trying to shove that thing into the wrong hole because it's got to fit. Because I saw Sister Susie and she went to church 135,000 times and she was the nicest person ever and she got sick. And if God really wanted her well, he would have just healed her. Heard theology like that? Like it's all waiting on God? Well, how about you need to adjust some things in your belief system and you'll find out that it's not waiting on God? If we dare believe it. 
if we dare believe it. So we've got to align ourselves. You know, there's apparent contradictions in the word of God. There are things that we've got to understand. And we say, you know, and, and of course the world knows, they, and they, oh, well, there's just so many contradictions in the Bible. It's just like they just dismiss the Bible. Oh, there's just contradictions. There's just contradictions. No, listen, most, most contradictions, most contradictions are apparent contradictions. And when you study it out, and if you've got a desire to understand it, you shouldn't be afraid of getting into it because God is consistent. The whole counsel of God. When Paul was teaching, he taught the whole counsel of God. Yes, he taught grace. Yes, he taught faith, righteousness. Yes, he wrote to the Ephesians that we've got to be rooted and grounded in love above all things. And there's these things. But did you read how much responsibility he taught? Did he teach you, this is what you've got to do? He corrected people. He said, this is the word of God for admonition and for counsel and for correction. That doesn't mean that those both exist in the same space, people. How you correct has got to be how you correct. But there is correction. There are things that, that the whole council, but you see what we don't want to do. We, we basically, if we don't physically do it, and there's a lot of religions that have literally, literally want James out of the Bible. They delete this. They tell you things like, oh, well, Jesus was an Old Testament preacher, whatever. It's like, what? They, they are quick to, because it doesn't fit in with their theology. It doesn't fit in with their traditions. If we want to be the light and the salt that Jesus called us to, we've got to do it his way. He, we've got to align with our, our belief system his way. You know, Danielle has uh, got braces right now. And, and you know, and I, I, you know it, what's amazing, her teeth were really skewed. Now they're quite straight. But what's fascinating about that, 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 little, that little band, that little steel band, that, that steel band that they put on a brace, that, that, and then they put those little brackets on each tooth, right? And then that's, they put in a new steel brand every now and again, and it pulls the teeth that are skew into the shape of that steel band. We are the ones that are skew. We are the ones that have to be pulled into alignment, if we will. If we will yield. But if I stood back and said, nah, I'm going to just carry on. I'm telling you, we get one piece of the word of God and we think, we hear, you know, God desires, John 10, 10, you know, he, he wants us, uh, God, he came to, um, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that you can have life and life more abundantly. So we take that and then we take life more abundantly and then we redefine that and we put it into the U.S. Declaration of Independence and we say, oh, yeah, the pursuit of happiness. That's what it is. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. God was wants me happy. Is that what he said? No, no, no. He said he wants to give you life and life more abundantly. But you see, we run off and we search for happiness. Do you know that you cannot find happiness if you look for happiness? That's a whole nother message. You can only find happiness if you understand what produces happiness. And God tells you what produces joy in our lives and what will produce joy in our lives. And it's, a, it's, it's actually happiness is a fruit of doing, of some of these things we're talking about. As you align yourself, you will experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. You will. The emotions that will come of it as you align yourself with will bring, but you see what we do, we redefine and we say, no, 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 no. I'm going to do it my way. This is what happiness means. My pursuit, my American right is for me to X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. That's how it's going to make me happy. And then we constantly try and pursue things that make us happy. And how many of you know where that road leads? How many of you have tasted and experienced firsthand how deep that rabbit hole goes? Because you never get happy. Eventually, you are doing more sex, you're doing more drugs, you're doing more alcohol, you're doing more, whatever it is, you are going further and further because you have made happiness your goal. Instead of aligning with truth, with your God who knows you completely and who wants to give you, and he wants to give you life and life more abundantly. That is a fact. So let him define that for you and not you define that for you. Let him tell you, listen, follow and do it my way. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you, upon you and learn of me. 
Do it his way and things will, it's like, life gets pretty awesome. Life gets awesome and awesomer and awesomer and awesomer. And relationships start lining up and things start happening and you're coming across purpose in your life and destiny in your life because you're doing it his way. And his way was like, hey, don't try and be the boss people, serve people. You don't like that. I want to be the boss. Who the uh, thinks that he is, uh, you know, I want to do it my way. But, but Jesus says, listen, listen, no, 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 go and serve. Go and love and go and serve and do this. Just receive my love and go and serve people. And guess what happens if you do it his way? Yes, you will get dirty. Yes, you may have to clean toilets. Yes, you may have, but I'm telling you, you stumble into life and life more abundantly when you do it his way. And when you do that, then one thing happens, the next, the next thing happens, the next thing happens, and then you suddenly are experiencing purpose, you're experiencing destiny, you're experiencing fulfillment like you've never known, you've got a satisfaction that knows no thing. And then when somebody says to you, are you happy? You're like, happy? What? Happy, happy seems like a byword. It's like, who cares about what, what makes me happy? I'm so fulfilled. I'm so, I'm so in the zone of enjoying God and my relationship that I, 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 don't, I don't need X, Y, Z, whatever that is, to make me happy because he becomes my happiness. Remember that old song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? How does it go? No, eyes, on, eyes upon Jesus, lit full in his wonderful face. And the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Powerful. Yeah, I mean, it's just things start lining up. But you see, it means this isn't because you prayed a magic little religious prayer. It's not because you rushed to the front and you have awesome Keith and Sue and Steve and Elise who really know how to pray in people, for people. And like, oh, quickly, zap me. Give me one of those. Fix my problems. Didn't you have that one, Steve? Fix my problems. What was that one that you said? That you told me? Somebody once said? I don't know if it was you. Somebody else. Had, somebody told, once told me. They said, zap me. <laughs> Fix me. Like, you know, you can. Uh, I'm, you know, that's, I, I was bold enough to come to the front. So, least you can do. <laughs> just, just fix me. You know, no, listen, people, wisdom means that God will give you grace. His grace will operate in your heart. As his grace operates in your heart, it will empower you to make the right choices. Choices, 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 choices. They are your choices. You have power. You have power and the choices are yours. That's why Joshua said, I set before you life. And death, blessings, cursing. What 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 you gonna choose? What you gonna choose? You're gonna do it his way? Will you dare trust God? Will you see him as good? Will you follow his way? I think I honestly do believe it's simple. It's not as it's not rocket science. It's just it's just simply coming to Jesus and being willing to yield and to do it his way and know that he does want you to have a great life. He does want you. He want. He has. If you will be well, if you will be obedient, then we've spoken about the word shema before to hear and obey. If you will be obedient, you'll be willing to follow His voice and take those steps. I'm telling you, not only for your life, but for your family, your friends, for the kingdom, people. The kingdom needs you. America needs you to be light and salt. We need you. We all need to. And listen, we're all on the journey. Like I said last week, where it doesn't matter if you've been born again one day or a thousand years. We are on a journey. And that's okay. It doesn't matter if you just, let's just take the next step. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your love and goodness. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the helper that's able to work with us to take hold of things, to show us, to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, to pray as we ought, to pray according to your will. 
thank you, Lord, that as we pray in the Spirit, your word says that we edify ourselves, we build ourselves up, that we build up our most holy faith, that we keep ourselves in your love. Your word says that in this is rest and refreshing in Isaiah 28. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We so appreciate your presence in our hearts and lives. And Father, for those here that one, do not know you, and two, maybe they don't know this infilling of the Holy Spirit that way. Father, I just pray for them. And thank you, Father, that as they respond, if they, even if they're watching online, that's just a desire. That's just a quick shift in your thinking. It's a quick shift in your desire. What do you choose? What do you choose? Simply, you just tell God. What is it that you want from him? Why are you watching this show, program? Why do you come to church? You have a great calling, a great purpose in the kingdom, a unique and very, very specific purpose. You have great value. We all have the same value. Every single one of us know that you have value. So Father, I just commit each one of our hearts to you and I thank you that you're taking us, that we have hearts ready to receive your word, that we, that we are willing to be malleable. We are willing to receive that implanted and grafted word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, doing your work.